Uh, hi all, my name is Pablo Arredondo. I'm a fellow at the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, uh, also known as Critics, and uh, Vice President of Legal Research at a uh, legal research startup called Case Test, um, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, and my work, uh, Codex, uh, focuses on isolating and leveraging uh, patterns in judicial opinions. Um, and we'll get into sort of what that means. Um, I'm going to be talking about a specific pattern that uh, has been very uh, fruitful um, in terms of leveraging it. And uh, the, talking a little bit more about some other patterns, and then actually, we're gonna, at the end of this time, I hope to have you guys submit some patterns that we can try in real time to see you know, how many show up and what they look like. All right, so um, we're all familiar with uh, Westlaw, uh, and they put at the top of their judicial opinions summaries of the case holding. Um, and uh, these are useful, you don't find these are written by their editors, they're different than head notes, um, and they help you in a concise way sort of understand the case you're about to read. Um, they're written as sort of one size fits all, um, as they must be, because they're just one guy trying to write it. Um, here's an actual photograph of the process of being created. Um, you see the, the team of Westlaw uh, editors hard at work, trying hard. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things we're doing with case text is trying to say, well, how can we uh, get as much of the functionality of the four fee systems, but still have the system be free, right? That's really our fundamental challenge. And uh, it occurred to me that there's somebody else who's writing concise summaries of case holdings. Judges. Uh, judges are constantly writing these, and the common law is filled with these wonderful, concise summaries. Um, if only we would extract them and leverage them out. Um, I sometimes uh, refer to this as sort of common law origami, if you will, because we're basically taking the corpus of judicial opinions and folding it in on itself in certain ways to create a, uh, a you know, value and sort of added uh, stuff to a legal research platform. So, uh, okay, so we've all seen um, what these parentheticals look like. Um, uh, you know, they, uh, the blue book actually has a, a rule about them uh, and exhorts their use. Uh, Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, in her uh, article about what she likes to see in briefs, said that she likes to see explanatory parentheticals. Um, and uh, fortunately for us, uh, the blue book dictates a certain format um, for the most part, which is they're going to follow a reporter citation and they're going to begin with a present participle. Now, for the first you know, six months of this, I call these things gerunds instead of present participles. Apparently, a gerund is like a noun, like he gave you a reading at the, at the mass, whereas these are present participles. So anyway, um, and so the question then is, okay, if we, we see these concise summaries and we want them, the question then is how do we harvest them? Uh, and this is where uh, regular expressions come in. Uh, who here is familiar with regular expressions? Heard of them? Okay. So only in computer science could this be called a regular expression, um, but this is in fact one. Um, regular expressions are one of the coolest things that I've ever come across, and I just wish I had, had them in my life earlier. Um, here is a cartoon. Uh, this, this screen's not great, but basically uh, the, the, the stick figure saying, oh no, the killer must have followed her on vacation. And the other guy, and she says, but to find them, we have to search through 200 megabytes of emails looking for something formatted like an address. And then you hear everyone stand back, I know regular expressions, and in swoops the hero, and off he goes. And one of the proudest days of my life was when an engineer in case that actually bought me and he said, everyone stand back, I know regular expressions teacher. So, <laughs> very honored for that. Um, uh, if you're interested in sort of uh, reading up on them, uh, there's a great resource, uh, codingforlawyers.com, uh, chapter one, uh, where he really lays out sort of gets into them style. Um, they might seem intimidating, but they're really not. Um, especially as we're as a, a law folk, we're used to Boolean connectors, we're used to using parentheses. These are the sort of things that happen. So in fact, to just jump into this one, um, and then red isn't great, but basically, um, you see that V there at the beginning that is in red? That is like the verses in a case citation, right? So I'm using the V as sort of a marker. And then I'm saying, uh, giving anything that's not a parenthesis up until 0 through 9, 4, Parenthesis, because that's how you end the date court parent, uh, you know, little parenthetical, right? So it'll say John versus Doe, uh, 411 US 129, and then in parentheses, the year, right? And if it's a circuit court, it'll say Ninth Circuit in the year. In both cases, it ends with a four digit number of the year followed by a parenthesis. Then there's just a space, and all of these little ones with the question mark and the uh, exclamation point are basically those are called negative look ahead assertions. I'm saying I don't want it if the word is cited. I don't want it if the word is quoted. There are certain present participles that are just noise. You don't want them, right? So I say then, uh, 
you see this A through Z, that's saying, that's saying I want a lowercase letter. And then before any space, I want to see an ING. Right? So that basically is saying, give me a, a letter like H, and then I don't want any spaces, and I want to find the ING. Right? That's how I uh, uh, happen to extract them. Um, my uh, regular expressions are not, you know, by any means those of a master. I'm sure there could be different ways to do it. Um, and in fact, I've been told by some of the engineers that there's actually superior ways than regular expressions, which made me really sad. Um, you know, when I was six years old, my dad told me that the Beatles were better than the monkeys, and I cried because I just couldn't understand that they were something better than the monkeys and the band. I sort of felt that way about regular expressions. Anyway, um, and then this is just a bunch of other look behind assertions saying that I don't want the parenthetical to end with, say, let's say it says rule 16A in parentheses. So the, the, sorry. the parenthetical says, holding that rule 16A does not apply in the context of blah, blah, blah. I don't want it to end with that little A, right? I want it to go all the way to the end of the parenthetical. So these little guys here are basically a bunch of things that I don't want to happen uh, uh, right before the parenthetical. Um, if it sees that, it skips and it goes to a parenthetical that doesn't happen. Um, that, uh, I don't know how clear that was. These take a, a while maybe to, to sort of pick up. But the point is, is that basically all you're doing is saying, you know, searches and then using these negative look behind and look ahead assertions to sort of filter down the searches and what you're doing. Um, it really is easy to pick up, and the best evidence of that is that I was able to pick it up. So, what happens when you run these regexes on the common law? Um, the great Mitch Hedberg had a joke, my apartment is infested with koala bears, it's the cutest infestation ever. It's really better the way he says it, it's really hard to capture his voice. But uh, the common law is infested with these explanatory parentheticals, and it, I submit, is one of the most useful infestations ever. Um, in fact, I got over 600,000 of them running it on a corpus of state and federal opinions. So, at first, I only wanted ones that began with the word holding, right? Because I'm like, I don't want to use this I just want holding. But then, as I was doing and sort of looking through them, I saw the ones that had similarly strong words like finding or concluding, right? And in fact, here's a word cloud showing the different uh, present participles uh, from the parentheticals that I extracted, right? So not surprisingly, courts, and these are basically all the things that courts do. Courts hold, courts find, courts recognize, they explain, they apply, right, they conclude. And you see that they're all, not all sort of equal, right? I, I divide them I'm thinking to strong ones that are really directed at the ruling or the holding, holding, finding, concluding, and then ones that are a little bit more uh, sort of dicta, you know, things like noting, discussing, examining, um, and then you have, you know, sort of ones in between, like applying, explaining, you know, none. So, um, and then if you're not the word cloud type, here's a chart at the top one. Um, interestingly, uh, noting. Um, it's pretty high up there, right? So the one that's sort of dedicated to dicta is pretty high up there. All right, so um, we've now pulled out 600,000 concise case summaries. And really, if you think about it, imagine in the private sector if you tried to get judges to write a database, of, you know, to write a book of 600,000 concise case summaries, right? It would be very, very expensive. Fortunately, of course, our tax dollars have already paid the judges to do this, so this is completely free now. Um, and the question then is, you know, how best to put it to work? And I'm going to talk about a couple things there. Um, and, and I mentioned sort of case text. Our goal is to create a free research database that is sort of curated and annotated by a bunch of resources. So this is one of the things that we included. Um, it's called Digital Summaries. And I think I'm going to try to be great here and just, let's just see what happens. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so. All right. Um, somebody like to call out a narrative law that they are interested in, or legal search topic. Not all of them. Antitrust. Antitrust. Okay. Antitrust. Okay. Boom. You get your results. That's really not the best case to have there, but okay. Let's scroll down to an actual antitrust case. Uh, Okay, so here you have uh, this case, uh, Monell New York City Department. If we go over here, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this okay, but you see these are judicial summaries. I don't know how many there are. Uh, 196 of them. So, 196 times this case has been summarized by another court in this concise format of a parenthetical. And 
That's not uh, that's on the high end of the spectrum. But in important cases, you're going to find not one or two of these. You're going to find dozens. Sometimes you know over 60 or 50. And what you get, and you'll notice some of these are actually not ING words. We've been you know increasingly expanding them. I, I get sort of addicted to harvesting them, so I keep getting more and more lenient in terms of what I learn. But there you see one about the holding of the case, something about how the case the court construed the word pension, what it established. Right? Uh, another thing of holding. And then here you have the source case. This is where we extract the parenthetical pull from. All right, so, um, and, and I welcome you guys all to Case Text is completely free. Um, at your leisure, go to casetext.com. Um, to load them all up, you actually have to sign up, um, but that's completely free. Um, so I submit, though, that there are some advantages to having this system. First, cases are rarely monolithic, right? A case very rarely stands for just one thing. Right? And so what you have with Westlaw and Lexis is the editor trying to write this one-size-fits-all summary of the case. What you get with these, though, are many different courts looking at the case from many different contexts and citing different aspects of the case. Right? So depending on what you're interested for in research, you can scroll through these and say, okay, wait a minute, this is the, you know, this is the holding that does matter, as opposed to these other holdings. And it's not just the holdings, it gets into like smaller things about the case, right? So you get a more complete picture when you have a, a number of summaries of a case from different uh, contexts, right? And then, uh, okay, well, so you know, so that's the sort of idea. Do we want to try one more just to see that I'm not just... Can I ask you one question? Did you group those like, uh, like sort of like Google would ask cited ask and give like counts and things like that? We should and we don't. Right now, there is no order to the group. And actually, that's something I love the, the group's feedback on. I thought about maybe just putting only ones that say holding at the top, because like that's where the meat is at. Another way to do it would be based on the citation of the case, yeah. but it's hard because I, I really, what I want with the perks of this right now is for me to understand this case that I'm about to read. And I feel like the holdings are the best one there. Um, another thing we're gonna let you do is you can search through them, and then things like, if you enter a search query like patent, and then click on a case, we can put the patent judicial summaries up at the top, right, ones that include the word patent. Um, but I, I, I really invite you guys to take an area of law that you're kind of interested in or a case that you have a lot of familiarity with and see it in action. Because it really does show how there's different nuances of a case. And if you compare that to, compare that to the vanilla one size fits all Lexus one, I think you'll find advantage. Um, there's going to be, we're switching back to the slides in a second. The next slide is going to say the word citator. So I think that one of the huge challenges that we have in the free law movement and trying to create a free legal research platform is the citator. Right? You don't have free law if you still have to go pay Westlaw and Lexus to cite check your case. And tellingly, uh, Lexus and Westlaw no longer sell their citator a la carte. You can't just go and say, I only want to pay the shepherd out. No, you have to buy their whole thing. Right? So um, that's a challenge that I think uh, uh, there's a number of different things that we're going to be looking at to try to solve it. One aspect of this, um, these judicial summaries, is they're certainly not a complete citator. But by definition, you're getting a list of cases that cite to your case. And because the parenthetical tells you how they summarized it, you're getting some inkling of what they cared about in your case, right? So, you know, this is, let's say, official capacity. You know, if you were researching official capacity as the issue, you would see that here's a case that actually cites to this case and actually notes the official capacity aspect of it. Whereas other cases will cite to different aspects of it, right? So it's a form of citator, sort of a, an incomplete citator, but one that uh, gives you actual information about the case relationship. What part of the case do they care about? All right, so now, All right. But I think there's other ways that we can use these for citators. Um, and uh, here, I think this is a continuation of, in some sense, of the great work that uh, Ed Walters and his team at Fastcase did with the Bad Lava. Um, I look at Bad Lava as one of the great examples of judicial origami um, that you can see. What they did with Bad Lava is they said, okay, the blue book dictates that if you're signing to a case that has strong negative treatment, you need to include that, right? Let me try to highlight it, right? Sorry. Well, anyway, here where it says Ohio v. Roberts, blah, 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 abrogated by Crawford v. Washington, and then the site. That's not an accident. It's not like the author just, the judge just decided, hey, I want, to, I want to let people know that this case has been abrogated. They have to do that. I mean, they don't have to, but they do by convention. Um, and so what Ed and his team did is they said, well, let's extract all of those, right? And now we have citator uh, entries that not just tell you that this case cites this case, but that this case abrogates this case, right? Or this case vacates this case. And that's the critical thing I think you need in the citation. Right, is don't just tell me that this case cites my case, tell me something about the nature of that relationship, especially if it's strongly negative. So, 
Oh boy, you probably can't read these at all, but okay. Where I think the parentheticals can be useful in expanding this um, is that thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of these parentheticals don't just describe a, a summary of the case holding. They describe how the case impacted an earlier case, right? So what you're seeing there is, and I'll just sort of read these. I, this is a, based on a prototype I built. Um, if you type in the word Terry, let's say we're, we're shepherdizing Terry in Ohio, right? Uh, these parentheticals all say things like, you know, uh, Prouse, then the site, extending the holding of Terry to car stops. Now that's a very useful citator entry, right? That's not just saying, you know, applauding or disgust. That's telling you specifically what it did, right? Uh, another one, uh, you know, Chavez, holding that nervousness alone does not establish a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity and therefore cannot justify a continued detention beyond the purposes of a Terry stop, right? So what you're having here are these judges doing this wonderful thing for us, which is they're writing about how case A impacts case B and uh, is not limited to negative treatment, right? One of the, the, the limitations of the bad law law, and I think where it got its name, is that you're only required to write strong negative treatment in the citation, right? So what about distinguishing? What about extending? What about applauding all these other useful things? These you can get those from, right? Um, so uh, I think ultimately you're going to have a citator where uh, you can, uh, when you're shepherdizing your case, you're going to see all of these parentheticals that relate to your case, right? Um, any questions about that? Does that sort of make sense? Okay. All right. So uh, other pack. So I found that there are other very simple patterns that aren't quite as well behaved as the parentheticals, but are pretty darn good in their own right, right? And they're so simple, right? This pattern, when a sentence begins with the capital, with the capital in, followed by an italicized capital letter, that's it. A court saying in this case, and lo and behold, there's, you know, and here would be the uh, regular expression, God, this is horrible, but it's basically just period, in, italic, capital letter. Uh, lo and behold, you find that there's hundreds of thousands of these, and they say things like, in Apple Barrel Products, the Beard, the site, the Fifth Circuit allowed the plaintiffs to maintain an action for copyright infringement, although they had not received an actual registration certificate or a registration refusal from the copyright office. Fantastic summary, right? Um, you know, these sentences, uh, sometimes they're not, but I'd say 97, 98% of the time, they're these very useful summaries that extend not just to the fact, uh, law, but sometimes the facts, too. They'll say, in this case, these were the facts, and here's how the court ruled, right? So, uh, and these have also been incorporated into the judicial summaries on case sites. So in this case is U.S. v. Flynn, and here you have a court saying, in U.S. v. Flynn, we held it was still appropriate to engage in the white tripartite analysis since it comports to the Supreme Court's approach. So there you have the we, the we being the Tenth Circuit, and this is also the Tenth Circuit case, right? So um, uh, just another example of how the simplest of patterns, if used correctly, uh, can create databases of fantastic value, um, which can then be appended. And um, as I mentioned, I think that there were about a quarter million of these that I pulled out with my rudimentary techniques. I'm sure that the harvest could be better. Um, Done more thoroughly. So, other potential uses for these summaries. So, I think one thing that I'm, I'm really interested in exploring is how they can be used for a machine learning training set. Um, are, how many people are familiar with machine learning? Sort of training set. Okay, baby, right? You're, you're sort of aware of this problem, like, oh man, we need to go get you know 20 research assistants to go hand tag what this case, what the holding of this case was, right? Um, if because these parentheticals often have pin sites, right? They'll tell you the specific page in the parenthetical. It's the equivalent of a judge going through the case and making a little annotation of what happened on that page, right? So, I mean, to make one example, if we wanted to train a system that can recognize what page a case holding occurs on, what better training set than you know 200,000 instances where the, the exact page of the holding has been noted by a court, right? And that's what the pin sets are. Um, another uh, example is enhancing keyword searches in terms of TF-IDF. So if I type the word patent and I do a search, what does is, what is Westlaw and Lexis calculate? They see how many times does the word patent appear just in that case, right? Um, and there's certainly other things that go into it, but in terms of the keyword, that's what they're doing. But imagine now if you said, I don't just want to look at the text of the case, I want to look through all the parentheticals that describe the case, right? And if the word patent appears in there, that's wow, that really must be related to the case because you know these parentheticals don't mess around, right? These parentheticals don't have a lot of noise and extra stuff where they're talking about the facts and anything like that. They really are condensed summaries of just the holding. So I think that uh, 
we should be leveraging them as a really useful source of information. The other thing that's interesting with them is uh, synonyms. So uh, there was a case where I typed, um, uh, I did a search for uh, African American, and uh, this case would not be returned because the court used the word black in an earlier decision, right? When you look at all the parentheticals describing that opinion, you find both African American and black being used, right? So by enhancing, extending your search to not just look at the court decision, but also all the parentheticals, you can sometimes find sort of synonyms, words that are synonymous, right? That are being used, uh, you know, indeterminately uh, by different courts, right? So you know, one court wants black, one court says African American. They'll both be represented there, so you'll catch it that way, right? So that's an instance where you could, you know, catch a case that you might have missed relying just on keyword uh, uh, alone. All right. So uh, switching gears a second uh, to. Uh, other patterns now, now, so the same approach that you use to find these useful case summaries can actually be used to isolate legal principles, concise statements of legal principles. And this is something that Lexis and Westlaw, through their algorithms and also their editors, try to do, right? They take the case and they say, let's pull out you know, where these legal principles are. Um, and uh, I found that these two phrases uh, appear hundreds of thousands of times in the common law and invariably are followed by a concise articulation of legal principles. Right? Across all jurisdictions you see it. It's actually in Canada, Australia, it goes back to England where like, instead of an S, it like, was an F, like it is well settled. Um, so, uh, you know, this is another example where a very small, simple pattern can be used to create this fantastic database that just has nothing but really concise legal principles in it. And, you know, for a litigator, sometimes it's useful to, want, you, when you're writing your brief, you'd rather have the site that says it is well settled, right? That's a sort of better way to do it, and that way it's harder to fight. So that's one use for a database like that. Another would be if you're not familiar with an area of law, type it in, and you see the sort of scaffolding, all of the well-settled principles of that area of law, right? Now, of course, there's huge blind spots. It doesn't catch unsettled areas of law. Um, but uh, you can check that out. There's actually a prototype of that at wellsettled.com if you want to look at that. It's a very ugly career that represents my abilities in coding. Um, so, um, all right, so I guess what I want to do now is ask you guys, are there other patterns, now that you sort of get the idea here, right? We're going to take patterns that we've seen a lot, and we're going to pull stuff out with them, right? Using regular expressions. I want to, let's just do it. Why not, right? All right, so here we go. Here's our little script. Uh, this is a very easy Python script. It just says blah, 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 blah. This is the current thing. It's a little hard to do this one. Okay, patterns, people. <laughs> Don't worry, no pressure. We got we got a lot of time. <laughs> Maybe like an open question, or something like that. So uh, it, it remains an open question. For yeah, something like that. <laughs> and I'm just saying, then give me everything. Until a period. Okay. All right. Now let's go. Courts are divided. Sorry, it's a little hard to open our internal. Have you ever just run uh, on the on the corpus looking for italics and seeing what words happen to go next to it to see if you're missing something? Yes, actually, I have. It's interesting. Hold on, what's going Sorry. <laughs> uh, we have a hit here. One trick at a time. running as we speak right now. Mm.
right, you see them coming in right now. Okay. So it's working, right? We're now pulling out open questions. Um, and to simplify the code, I actually, uh, we're not pulling out the case site where it comes from. That's very simple to do. But uh, there you go, right? You've now leveraged, found and isolated and leveraged a pattern of judicial things that pulls in. Um, and I can see this actually being kind of useful, right? Because you're finding questions that relate to your face and sort of saying nothing to the celebrates of date, which I like. All right. Hey, Pablo. Yeah. I have one. Okay, it's a practical one. One so, second. I don't. Go ahead. It's a little different from what we've been doing. Or That's been totally doing. okay. So, in habeas, cape, habeas, cape, habeas cases, there's a, you know, the big. <clears throat> did the petitioner preserve the issue for appeal? And but what's really interesting is the, the parts of the opinion that say petitioner failed to preserve issue for appeal, and then it goes on to say why. So I wonder if so, you could do petitioner failed to preserve issue for appeal, uh, or is that too long? No, the, the regular questions are nothing too long. You okay. can do whatever you want. All right, so who wants? Petitioner failed. To preserve. 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 Issue. Issue. For appeal. And now here, instead of going just to the end of the sentence, it sounds like you want to go further, right? Sort of. So I don't think we have a paragraph marker, but what we can do is say, give us you know the next 400 words after that, right? So one of the things that you want uh, is the ability to. Uh, find out where something ends, right? So parentheticals are very easy because they end. Sentences, not as much, but okay. So How could okay. you make sure it's just habeas and not all the other administrative yeah. uh, litigation where petitioners fail to preserve issues? Or even special proceedings? How can you mm -hmm. limit it to habeas? So what I would do there, and it's a little more involved than I can do in this coding at this weird angle, <laughs> was create another rug X that says habeas, and then have it say, only if you find that, then print this stuff out, mm -hmm. right? Does that make sense? Um, okay, so here we go. We're gonna uh, sorry, so now we're going to run this thing in terminal. I can really, you know, you told me I could fix this for the screen. And I was like, oh, don't worry about it. Okay. I can fix it right now. Do you want me to? Oh, do you want to? Awesome. All oh. right. <laughs> See, no pressure. I'm sure on the, the lecture how to ruin a PowerPoint slide presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if you can do that. It's Questions are still filing in underneath you. <laughs> There's still uh, remains open questions filing in there. Or is this the. I was going to be early, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. So then I see what's. <laughs> Missing an end brace on that 400. I can't uh, quite see. Excellent. Done with the period. Um, this ray.m, by the way, is key. That means look over multi lines. I was so amazed when I found out that you could run these searches over multiple lines and not just have to hope it all appears on the line. Um, these are the joys of learning something for the first time. All right. Showtime. And then you get this great moment of suspense where it like starts and you're like, oh my god, is it going to come? Is it going to come? 
it's so fun, such a rush. <laughs> Failed to preserve issue for appeal. Oh, I know what I forgot. Excuse me, I have to skip that. Too. Certain characters, like the percentage sign, mean something in the code, so you can't just put it there as a match. You have to actually put a slash before it. Now we should get into this. Let's see. So it's not cap sensitive. Oh. Wait, no, I'm sorry, it is cap sensitive. Yeah, I don't see an I flag on there. Right, so it can be I, and that would be. I don't know if they capital do I petition all caps and they do that. Dot I, I think I get that. Okay, we're going to try it again, not cap specific. Or maybe all those cases are at the end of the zip file. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, we, we are searching you know, 5 million individual opinions, so, and actually, you know what, depending on how it's ordered, we might be starting at the beginning of the common law. <laughs> so, um, let's see, all right, well, let's give it a little while longer. Um, anyone else uh, thinking of uh, patterns while we do this? I, I have a pattern, but also a question, I'm sorry, I'm sleeping. Um, do you limit this to a library, like a jurisdiction or a topic, or you're searching the whole world? I like to uh, search the whole thing. I like to go okay. genomic, as I said, here. I look at the whole thing. Um, because I really, for a lot of these, it doesn't occur a lot, right? I'm not interested, right? So uh, there's a phrase, it is axiomatic, that's sort of like it is well settled. It appears right. about 50,000 times. Pretty good, mm -hmm. but not, you know. And then there's things like it is black letter law. You only get like a couple thousand. How about first impression? <laughs> All right. All right, Danny, I think we're going to give up on this for now. I'm <laughs> sure it's there. All right. So what we want now is, do you want just any sentence that has first impression? I don't know you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's go right. The uh, word we, talking, speaking of very simple patterns that you can leverage, sentences that begin with the word we are very useful too, because the court's saying something about what they're about to do or what they did. Um, so we. Um, and you know, it's interesting, so a lot of times with data processing, they get rid of stop words. That's the first thing you do is get rid of all these words that are so common, like the, you know. And I found that sometimes there are like these little stop words that could. You know, these stop words that actually are really useful um, if you understand like legal text specifically. Um, I'm not screaming, so. Ah, here's comes one. <laughs> Here they come. So when you have like the really good ones, you're gonna find a flood. It's like crazy, right? So this is an example of one that's, and you know, obviously we want the beginning of the sentence here. The way I did it, you're only seeing, you know, the everything after it is an issue of first impression. But I'm wondering, should we just do it on appellate cases? You want to just limit it there? Because do district courts really mention first impression as much? Yes, they would. Yeah. All right. Uh, others. But the issue remains unsettled. Yeah, or if there's a, a thing in cases where the parenthetical talks about contrary authority, so signals that in indicate contradiction starting with contra or but C or right. but CF and show. Fantastic. I love that. That's <laughs> right. So, I mean, I think we, we know we're going to get a huge number of CFs, and that's something that I think needs to be leveraged in a, in a real way. Um, I, I won't do it here only because we're just going to get flooded with so many sure. things, and we'll just be psyched. Sometimes, though, the one parenthetical that uh, I don't like, it's holding same. 
right? <laughs> all right, all right, well, all right, I have to go back and find that earlier case. But once you do find it, then it's kind of interesting to be able to look at your case and say, show me all the cases that a court has said held the exact same thing, right? Quickly, string set that up. So we see these first impression kind of creeping in. This is an example where the period, right, so it, it, it ended at the first period that it sees. Um, so this N here, wait, is it not big for you? Can you read these at all? Okay. All right. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Using citation signals is a great area. I think a lot well, and if you have a particular case and you're looking at all the, you know, fifth circuit case and you wanted to see where the circuit splits mm -hmm. existed and you were able to, you know, limit it to the cases that cite your case and have a parenthetical that start with it. That is exactly right. All right. Just to show you what I mean about the we thing. And here I think I am going to limit it just to uh, circuit. Say both. Oh, oh, come on, come on. So we decide, you see, we decide, and then all of the different times the court says what the decision is, right? So this might seem a little like haphazard and kind of sprinkled all over the place. And the truth is, is that uh, I showed you guys the best pattern that I could find. You know, and I've been trying a lot of different patterns and experimenting with a lot of different ones. Um, but I hope to convince you guys that armed with just a nice little judicial corpus and very simple script, you can then uh, try out different patterns. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you're reading through cases, some might jump out and say, you know, that's a phrase I've seen a lot that I think means something, right? Um, and, uh, and try it. So I guess I didn't prepare, like, very long remarks. I, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought we were just going to start yelling out panic a little bit. <laughs> I, I have a question for you. About two years ago, I saw Tom Neal, who was at Sunlight at the time. Um, he gave a presentation in, in, which reported on a project he'd done for Canley, where he was looking at at sort of the lifespan of judicial opinions and citation. Yes. And then he found for sort of a regular case, it was around 15 years of memory serves, but for opinions of the, of the highest court in Canada, it was closer to 50 years. Yep. I wonder if there isn't some way when you're talking about doing some kind of citator to, to sort of melt that lifespan question with the, you know, with the parenthetical to see which, which cases sort of have more weight because they've been able to live longer, if that makes sense. Right, so you're saying just looking at the citation pattern. I'm not sure what I'm saying. I'm saying I think there's there's some kind of right. fusion that could be done there. Ravel has been doing some interesting stuff, sort of showing you the citation sort of path. And I think it, it, it works if you see the sudden drop off all of a sudden, right? And it goes to zero. Fortunately, that's not very common to have it like that, right? So I guess it would happen when the case was, was right. reversed. Right. Um, all right, are you guys all panicked out? Is there any <laughs> <laughs> Can you do the, uh, I believe someone mentioned either the uh, court's divided or remains un un unsettled? Or okay, so uh, it is unsettled.
There is conflicting authority on this question in the state courts. It is unsettled. Oh, so you see they start to come in. Right? So you see it. Um, and once you've done a lot of these, which I'm sure you guys will all go and be doing constantly, right? You have a feel for sort of what, what kind of yield you're going to get, right, early on. Um, but uh, yeah, the phrase it is unsettled is, is you know, much less common, but it's used sometimes. Um, you could build a fun little website around a phrase something like, the dissent misconstrues, you could pick out all the little uh, sniping that goes on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, I know. Um, in fact, the dissent, blah, 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 just the dissent. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure what you've learned from that, except <laughs> <at> the animosity. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go, the dissent. Yeah. Just the dissent is lower if you were. It's funny, it's interesting to see the dissent and see maybe 20 years later. Right. Yeah. Well, the, what I was going to suggest is just searching the parenthetical comma j period dissenting. Sorry, sorry, one second. We'll just, I ran into the dissent. You see it? This is, this is how the dissent looks. So, and these are words and sentences that start the dissent, not lower case. So my guess is these are going to be very useful sentences to have. Right? And you can start to sort of see, I guess it's not fun for you guys to just see scrolling text like that. <laughs> This is a new type of uh, presentation here, right? but you know, it's like you learn by doing, right? So, um, so then, yeah, you see all of these. Are these readable? I think I can do a few more. There was one earlier that said the dissent consistently ignores. <laughs> and then another thing you can do is you take these. And then you just go and isolate just the words that follow, right? So what are all the things that dissents are accused of doing, right? Yeah. Obscuring, ignoring, right? Mm -hmm. Misunderstanding, mm -hmm. right? So the dissent is a great example of one that's and it's legal specific, right? Only in law does that that word, the two little words mean anything. But then suddenly you have this wonderful database of dissent accusation. <laughs> all right, my friend, your turn. What's up? I was going to suggest like. Uh, the parent, the dis, the parenthetical that indicates you're citing to the dissenting opinion. So something, something, name, comma J, dissenting or C J dissenting. Oh, man, that's such a hard one to code, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> like you're right, but then like that's, 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 yeah. that one. We're gonna do that one because that gets into some snazzy stuff. I mean, I guess capital letter, period, right parenthesis, right? Would that do it? Because it's the judge's last name, comma, then J is first initial. Period. And dissenting or occasionally concurring or something like that. But we're just looking at dissenting. All right. We're going to, that's a, that a tougher one. Um, when you get into a lot of things like that. But it could be very valuable. Um, I like the dissent. Uh, oh, one that just like, question four. This one I found. Uh, now hopefully this thing will stay maximized. Again, these are sentences that only begin with the question before, right? Not. I find that sometimes when you make it, the sentence has to start with the pattern you get more sort of consistently what you're looking for, right? There's less room for it, right? And so then, you know, all of the different questions before the court. And I think, you know, beyond just having a database, I, what I'd like to see, you know how when you do like Wheel of Fortune at the end and all the RSLTs, they open those all up immediately, like all the very common ones? I think that there's a way that when you go to a case, if I could just see sort of what are these major sentences that are very often very indicative of what the court's doing, saying, holding things like that, could be a new way to sort of convey judicial opinions, right? Um, Oh, other patterns that I've used? Plaintiff in this case is A, or is N. Great pattern, right? And you get all of a sudden a huge database of cases and what the plaintiff was, right? Often Chevron, I don't know. Um, so uh, that's another example of a pattern that, uh, you know. So, so you guys sort of get the idea, right? Um, and uh, my email address is pablo at casetext.com. Feel free to email me. You know, any patterns, you don't even have to write the regex. We'll, we'll write them for you. <laughs> <laughs> but we should want to write the regexes because regexes are so fun and cool. Um, uh, so anyway, so that is a peek into sort of the work of uh, isolating and then leveraging uh, patterns in the common law.
And I think that there's a lot of times that are yet to be leveraged, um, and uh, it's the kind of thing where it's very easy to experiment or have your students experiment uh, with doing it. So, um, I guess with that, thank you guys so much for having me. And, uh,